All right. So we're going to talk about a Dutch settler. Uh, to, to be honest, I, I don't know if he was Dutch or German, because Dutch was often, you know, a mispronunciation or misspelling of Deutsch. So he could be German, could be Dutch. He certainly wasn't English. Anyway, uh, this is not a theory-ridden uh, talk. Uh, it's just sort of a kind of site report about what we did and what we found. And uh, it's, it's a project uh, like most of mine that was, sponsored, that was uh, required under law. And we, we, uh, we surveyed something called Compton Farm, which you could see on the left-hand side of the screen. Uh, that's superimposed on the 17th and early 18th century tracks of the area. This is down near Aquasco in Southern Prince George's County, uh, a little bit west of the Tuxent River and straddling, well, abutting against Swanson Creek, if you know that area. Anyway, um, the tract I'm gonna talk about is called Dove's Nest. And we found it initially by doing uh, just surface reconnaissance uh, in 2004. And the person you see off there in the distance uh, used to work with me, Dionysius Cavadius. Um, worked with me for a few years, started as a high school student, uh, got his master's from the University of Chicago and his doctorate from the University of Virginia. Um, he's uh, quite an excellent anthropologist. Anyway, he was walking the field. In this particular field, he found a probably 8,000 year old Clovis point. Um, so that's not the subject of tonight. <coughs> Funny, he brought it up to me, and I'm nearsighted as all get out. So he holds it up for me to see. Is this something? And I had to get pretty close, and I was within about 15 feet of him. I realized that's yeah, a Clovis point. <laughs> You're going to remember this for the rest of your career. I've never found a Clovis point in the, in the wild. Anyway, so we're talking about a, a tract uh, that was patented by a fellow named Bernard Johnson. And when we did this project and when I wrote the report on it, I always assumed Bernard Johnson was an Englishman. There was no reason to think otherwise. Uh, but after having written the report and while preparing a piece for publication in Maryland Archaeology, I did a little more research into him and found that he was a cooper. He made barrels. And he was also, quote unquote, a Dutchman. And we know that because in 1671, he was naturalized. Before he became naturalized, uh, he was not able to acquire land. So that's why he naturalized. And he patented two tracts uh, in 1679 and 1686. They're joining ones, uh, Dove's Perch and Dove's Nest, which is the property of interest. We don't know exactly when he died, but uh, sometime around 1700, he had four daughters uh, who um, inherited the land. All four were married. So they didn't own the land, their husbands owned the land. Um, in the 17th and 18th centuries and well into the 19th century, uh, a woman uh, generally did not own land in her own right. It was owned by her father or her husband, unless some special arrangement was made uh, to create a trust. Oh, we're ready for that now. So the land was divided amongst his daughters and their husbands sold the land in 1711. And I should say that uh, women did not own land, but they reserved a, a dower right in, the, in whatever their husbands owned. So upon their husband's death, uh, assuming it wasn't murder, uh, they were entitled to one third of uh, the husband's estate. And what if they, if they weren't married? Pardon me? What if they weren't married and they were orphaned? Uh, there were situations where women did uh, own land. Um, and, you know, when they did, had not married uh, or orphaned. But it, it was very rare to find an unmarried woman, especially in the 17th century. Up until the first few years of the 1700s, there was about one woman for every four or five men. There weren't a lot of women in the colony. So they had their pick. Some of you may have seen this, this is actually a map by a fellow named Ogilvy, but it's based on the 16, 
well, published in 1673, but the 1660s map of Augustine Herman, uh, who was a Bohemian, uh, Bohemia being a part of what I grew up knowing as uh, Czechoslovakia. I'm not sure what it is now. But um, he was sometimes referred to as a, as a Dutchman as well. And he was in New York City, uh, uh, Dutch New York City, if you will, in 1664. I guess it was English then. And came down to uh, Maryland. And basically, in exchange for a large manor up in Cecil County called Bohemia Manor, he, um, he produced this map for Lord Baltimore. And it's an interesting map. It's got all these little symbols along the coastline. And what it, that represents is that's where people were living. That's the lands they had patented and that they were farming in the 17th century. Uh, some archaeologists will tell you, and actually you could see symbols of towns too, for instance, Calverton. I don't know if you could see my mouse cursor, but there's a little symbol for a county seat, and there's one over in St. Mary's as well to the far left. And up so up uh, the upper part of the central part is Dove's Nest, approximate location. But some archaeologists will tell you, well, you could use this map to find plantation sites. That, you know, it's, it's an accurate map. But anytime you hear that, tell them to look at the, uh, the map more carefully. Look at the legend where Augustine Herman tells us, you can see it's, it's the fifth line down, his old symbol, like a house. And it says, plantations noticing only the manner of situation. In other words, these are symbols. They're not actual plantation sites. He's just telling you this is a, how people were uh, distributing themselves out on the landscape. And he also showed maps, you know, he showed where Indian houses and plantations were, uh, rivers, creeks, that sort of thing. So it's really a, a fine map that's relatively accurate for the time given that it was done aboard ship. But Dove's Nest is not on the Patuxent River. It's, it's, it's five or six miles inland. Uh, and that would have been unusual in the 17th century. Most 17th century plantation sites are right down on major waterways. And those waterways may have filled with sediment ever since, uh, but in the 17th century, most of these folks lived on navigable water or very close to it. So it's an unusual site having been found so far in, in the interior. A uh, modern topographic map, the red dot uh, near Quasco shows approximately where the site is. And this red line, this dashed line across, show, is a section that you could see below. So we have Swanson Creek here in the, the left-hand side, and down here you can see Swanson Creek. And so the, the vertical uh, scale here is exaggerated. It's, topography is not quite this, this uh, irregular. But we've got Swanson Creek, a bit of a ridge, and head of a little tributary. And it's up on this flat land that we have uh, the site. Oops. So here's the site. It was a cornfield. After we found it through surface collecting, we brought in machinery. Actually, we did some excavation units to test plow zone distributions of artifacts. That needn't detain us here. It wasn't a lot informative. But we brought in machinery and we stripped off the plowed soil. And anybody who's attended any of these talks the past year has sort of seen this method before. We strip it off with machinery and then we clean it down by hand. And that's what these guys are doing. That's Josh Bigelow on the left and Carolyn Gruchkowski on the right. Uh, Carolyn worked with me for a number of years. Uh, Joshua went into the army after working with me. I'm trying not to take that personally. But you could see where Carolyn's scraping here, you get some dark soil against a background of a yellowish brown subsoil. And here you can see it even better. There's Dionysius again on the left and Carolyn on the right, just troweling away. What they've got here are a series of intersecting uh, trash fill pits, uh, specifically burrow pits. These are pits where uh, the settlers would excavate sort of a silt loam, clay silt loam, mix it with a little bit of water to make, make mud, make plaster. And they would plaster their basket work uh, 
chimneys and, and fireplaces. So the fireplace would just be made of woven branches essentially and then plastered with mud. And you know, that soil came out of the ground. Once you have an empty hole, it's a good place to throw trash. That plaster, when it's exposed to the heat and weather, starts to crack, exposing the wicker work underneath. And if you've, that happens around your hearth, that wicker work could catch fire and your house goes up, uh, which is an important observation that you'll, you'll see why uh, uh, in a few minutes. So you have these burrow pits. And they also, we also found this cellar hole. It's not very big, but you could see uh, it's got this reddish material in it and that little entranceway at this end. All this is burned dog. And what that tell the, told us initially is that this building burned down. It was a catastrophic fire. And the hearth, the, uh, wa the, the dog, the mud on the hearth had basically, uh, through the heat of the fire, turned brick red, turned hard. It's like, it's almost like brick rubble, but it's not brick. And it just collapsed in on the root cellar. We also found a number of post holes and it doesn't show up, it takes a practice eye, but you could see right here is one post hole. You see it's got a kind of yellowish soil and some dark brown soil against a more uniform subsoil. And it also has this other post hole that went right through it, succeeding this one. This one replaced that one. And what they're doing is they're setting wooden posts in the ground and building a frame structure on top of those wooden posts. They are, for all practical purposes, the foundation. And here I've made it really easy for you uh, by drawing out uh, the blue line. These are two different pairs of post holes, but the blue lines represent the original post holes. The red lines represent replacement post holes. So at some point, the wooden post failed. Maybe they were eaten by termites, they rotted, who knows, but they failed. And so what the folks did was they dug a hole into uh, near the existing wooden post. They dug a hole, removed that post and put a new post in and then backfill the new hole. So that's what we're looking at. We're looking at simple replacement. And if that sounds difficult to do, it really isn't. Um, with, these, with these houses, you could just put um, you know, a couple of blocks of wood and get a nice long pole for a lever. You could just lever up one corner of the house. It isn't that hard. Um, we've done the same with uh, a three-story stone building in Virginia some years ago, just using a floor jack. It, and it's amazing how simple it is to do. The white solid lines represent the post molds. That's what's left of the wooden post that used to sit in, in that hole. There wouldn't be one for the earlier post holes because those posts were dug out. But uh, these, these show up fairly well in the field and they give us an idea of how large those posts were, close to a foot in diameter. Here's one of those post holes excavated, only half of it. Um, and so this is the profile. The rest of the hole goes up to the up, you know, to the upper part of your screen. These white lines indicate the edges of the post mold. So the wooden post sat right in here, and the rest of this is all just was all, all just backfill. And I think, well, judging from the scale, it looks like they went down about a foot and a half. If you figure we stripped off close to a foot of soil, that means these uh, posts went. Uh, the post hole is maybe uh, two and a half feet deep. That's kind of shallow. And it suggests that we've lost at least a foot of soil from erosion. And that's pretty typical on these sites. If you've heard me talk about these things before, it's, it's a common theme. In Maryland, we've lost a huge amount of soil through erosion, mostly agricultural, uh, mostly probably 20th century with the use of motorized plows. Carolyn, what, what Carolyn's doing here, she's uh, excavating one quarter of a, one of these burrow pits. And again, they dig out the soil, they mix it with water and create essentially a plaster. Well, if they're replacing the burned daub and the cracked daub on the chimney in the fireplace, what happens to that stuff? 
And what Carolyn's discovering right here is they took it and they dumped it into the borrow pit from which they got the new material. That's this all this lumpy stuff and reddish stuff that's all burned off that was removed and dumped in here after they dug out the soil. So a you can see a little bit in the lower uh, corner of this thing, a little bit of the, the bottom of this pit, but it's really filled up with all this burned off. And here's that pit excavated. So you could see this large, this massive pile of burned daub. And actually what was interesting is a lot of it wasn't even burned. A lot of it was essentially unburned mud that was distinguishable from the fill that it actually preserved. It just didn't meld back into the uh, soil matrix. So it was really kind of a very interesting feature. And you know, basically, this is uh, this is this is a typical setting for our excavation out there. Setting up a beach umbrella over over a lavish screen, uh, because uh, as we often do on important projects, we did it in the dead of summer. Well, probably June, I guess, judging from the corn. But it was hot, and once you scrape all that soil off, and the sun starts beating down on it, it's like working inside of an oven. Most uncomfortable. So here's that feature again, that, that cellar hole. Again, we have sort of an entrance way up here. And then it's sort of almost apple shaped to this thing and all filled with burned dog. And here's that same feature, mostly excavated. So we have the entrance way up top and we've left this balk in the middle. You could just see it's all filled with all this burned rubble. And you can even see a little bit of a pit in the upper right hand corner see that a little clearer with the next image. So here it is in profile. So you can see a little bit of it excavated back there. This is from the doorway. I guess I'm in the doorway shooting um, towards the back of the cellar. And you can see this massive deposit of burned daub here. On top of that, a lens of silt. On top of that, some more burned material and then the floor of the cellar. So it looks like what had happened is this thing had burned. Uh, there had probably been some wash from rain or whatever, some sediment settled in, and then the whole thing collapsed. At least the fire, the fireplace collapsed into the cellar. Uh, the neat thing about a catastrophic fire is that whatever was in the house at the time, it's there. I mean, people didn't have a chance to get this stuff out. So we got not a lot of material out of this site, but, um, it, what we did find was was pretty impressive. Lots of tobacco pipes, of course, and these are typical of the very late 19, uh, late 17th and early 18th century. Uh, they're all uh, almost certainly made in uh, England. Uh, we didn't see any Dutch made pipes. Uh, and pretty much the West Country of England. And we've been able to date those pipes. You know, some of you may be familiar with the techniques that are used, um, just measuring pipe bore diameters. Uh, we use drill bits. Uh, this is a technique developed by uh, Gene Harrington, Pinky Harrington, as he was called, who worked for the National Park Service. And he used to measure the interior, the bores, the, 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 the hole through which you suck smoke in the pipe with the uh, drill bits of different diameters. And it turns out they're 64th inch diameter. So uh, he was able to come up with what we call a seriation. And on the left, you could see pipes from the period 1680 to 1710 have a distribution that looks like this, normal curve, uh, relatively few 764ths, most of 664ths of an inch, and then relatively few 564ths. For the next period, 1710 to 1750, few 64ths as opposed to the column here, lots of 5 64ths and then fewer 4 64ths. Well, our site, um, I can't see because this thing's in the way. Um, you look at the distribution here, mostly 5 64ths, but lots of 6 64ths. It doesn't really fit either of these. It kind of fits in the middle. So these two distributions kind of bracket the date, the pipe stem date for this site. What we have, we've, we use a, an algorithm uh, developed first by Lewis Binford, then a fellow named Hansen, 
And we just have, we have a formula. We just plug in, you know, how many uh, for pipe stem bores of 764, it's how many? How many of six, how many of five, how many of four? And then using this algorithm, we can come up with a mean date. In this case, for uh, feature two, which is that cellar hole, the date is 1720. Now that doesn't tell us when they first started occupying it, and it doesn't tell you when they end. You know, it's just in the middle. So in 1720, this cellar hole likely was open and the structure was used. But the borrow pits have an earlier date, 1703, and that suggests that those borrow pits were used for trash and feature two, the cellar hole was the last thing to fill in at the, you know, probably towards the end of the occupation of the site, if not the end. So for the site all told, based on 184 measurable pipes, we have uh, mean dates that depending on whose formula you use, 1714 to 1723. My guess is we have an occupation that runs from about uh, 1680 to uh, 1730, somewhere in that range. And again, you know, for those dates, we have our Dutchman. He's there, you know, 1671 is naturalized, but he's acquiring these lands around 16 in this, around 1680s. So he likely is the occupant. He died in 1700. But well, we know, yeah, just because he died doesn't mean the site's abandoned. Uh, when the sun sold out in 1711, was that because the house burned down or was it a successor? Was there a second household occupying that site? Uh, based on the information we have right now, we don't know. Uh, but more work can be done, not archeologically, it's all the whole farm's been redeveloped, uh, but certainly archival research can be done to maybe answer some of the questions we have. So what did we come up with? We've got big pieces of burned daub. I mean, some of the more impressive pieces I've ever seen. And it's clearly local soil and it's got what we call inclusions. It's got little bits of stuff, little bits of artifacts. Because the site's been occupied for a while, there's trash all over the place. So when they dig a hole and they mix up mud, you know, it's not surprising that small artifacts get mixed in. A view of the cellar. Uh, with all these different section lines running through. And that's so we could draw different profiles of the cellar to get sort of a three-dimensional sense of what this thing was look like. But you could see the, the major section, GH, running through here, represented here. And you can see lots of fire of um, burned daub sitting on some finer sediments and then some fire red material. Even the wall of the cellar hole had turned red from the heat of the fire. So there's no doubt that there was a catastrophic fire accounting for the loss of the building. Now we surveyed a lot of acreage out there. We didn't find any other buildings of that, any other sites of that period. So uh, the, the farm, the, the plantation may have been occupied, almost certainly was occupied after the house was destroyed, uh, but they put their house somewhere else. Here's that cellar hole, nearly fully excavated. You notice in the upper left-hand corner, this, this kind of deeper part here that's been excavated is more of it that survives here. You can see the discoloration of the soil. And a full view of it, here it is completely excavated. It was actually a pit there. And that storage pit, that little root cellar, uh, clearly was expanded at one point to this larger cellar. Now, when you remember the post holes that we looked at, they'd been replaced. So this building must have been up for uh, several decades, probably. We estimate before you replace, by the time you need to replace post on one of these buildings, it's usually something on the order of 15 to 20 years. So the posts had been replaced, a cellar had been expanded. This, this, uh, house very likely was occupied for maybe 30 years. And some of the stuff that came out of there, melted glass, lots of melted glass. Uh, some of it's from windows, some of it probably from other glassware. But we did get in a small inset here is actually a, frag, a, a fragment of a diamond shaped window pane 
had survived. Uh, but most of the glass in there had melted. Not only had it melted, but you see this uh, central piece, the lighter colored kind of swirly thing here in the middle. We found a couple of pieces like that when we were excavating that you could see silver running through them. And it looked like an old fashioned mercury thermometer. And the silver wasn't silver, it was lead because these are casement windows made up of diamond shaped panes held together with strips of lead, much like you'd see in a, a, a church window. And it, the fire had melted the glass and the lead together. So we know this is a catastrophic fire. Folks probably didn't have any time to get anything out of there. We did not find any human remains, so nobody went up with the building, as far as we could tell. Some other artifacts we found, some of them we've not yet really identified. The upper left-hand corner, obviously, is, is an ax, uh, not surprising. The lower, in the left-hand side, the lower piece, uh, I mean, it almost looks like a hammer. It may well be a mill pick. And a mill pick is uh, sort of a cutting hammer used to sharpen millstones. Now we're right near uh, Swanson Creek. It was almost, there was almost certainly a mill somewhere along there. It is possible that um, there was a mill right here at some point. The piece in the middle looks like some sort of clamp, but I have no idea what it is. Uh, up the top, we got folding knives or razors. Uh, the top one is probably a razor for shaving and the one below a clasp knife or a pocket knife. And then below a smoker's companion, which is this kind of Rube Goldberg looking type uh, iron artifact used for cleaning out and your tobacco pipe and tamping down the tobacco in it. Uh, they're not unusual finds on 17th century sites, but we rarely find more than one or two of them. Uh, none of this stuff has been conserved or I didn't conserve it in any case. Uh, it should all be, it's all at the uh, Mac lab now. Hopefully somebody's taking a look at it because these things will turn to dust from the rust. And it's just inevitable unless they're stabilized, we remove the salts from them and uh, start cleaning them up, remove the rust and maybe even treat them with tannic acid to keep that from rusting further. All right, come on, there we go. Some of the smaller things that we recovered from the site. No, we didn't recover the Lincoln penny. That came out of my pocket, uh, but it, it, it was a useful scale. But you can see below it a brass pin uh, of the exact type this, um, described by Adam Smith, Wealth of Nations, 1776, kind of the uh, first theorist of capitalism. He describes how, in his book, how pins were made to talk about division of labor. And this is a perfect example of how they were made. A uh, piece of lead shot, a couple of uh, furniture, upholstery tacks, a thimble. And it's a piece of bone or ivory that's been inscribed, uh, decorated, and looks to me like one of those things, uh, barrette, I think the word is, that women will, would wear in their hair. Um, it's certainly worth a little more research. Uh, figure out what it, what, it, what it is and how it was used. But it's an interesting artifact. We often don't find nicely, you know, hand-decorated, personalized pieces like that. The wine bottle on the left, uh, I managed to glue it together, but it's kind of wonky because it had been warped by the heat of the fire. So there's no way it will ever fit together perfectly, not without reheating it, you know, remolding it. And the piece on the right is just a classic British stoneware beer mug. Uh, we often find these on sites in the 17th and 18th centuries, particularly 18th century. Uh, and they look pretty much just like this. And they're used pretty much as you'd expect them to be used. Uh, this also did not mend back perfectly um, because it was warped by the heat. And you maybe you can see, but and the bottom of the mug is an extra piece of clay. This wasn't from the far, this is actually an imperfection from the potter. Uh, this was a second, it was a cheapie. <laughs> On the right, you'll see uh, 
very classic examples of uh, a Rhenish stoneware bulbous mug uh, with some uh, pieces of clay that have been stamped out and then kind of welded to the body uh, for decoration. Often they're coats of arms, uh, often dashed in the 18th century, a little bit of uh, uh, purple slip. On the left is a vessel that actually came from the Patuxent Point site. Um, a little bit early, a little bit earlier than this site, but it's it's the only one where I've reconstructed on paper what one of these what one of these mugs look like. I should just get a photograph of a complete one. And we found a couple of these uh, pewter spoons. Uh, the top one, where you actually have a bowl of the spoon, you could just make it out. It's got a little bit of a touch mark on it. Uh, and I'm sure I looked at it and I just don't remember what it is we saw on it, but it would have some sort of symbol representing who the pewterer was who made this spoon, presumably back in England. The one below is just the handle, the trifid handle. Uh, again, these are not unusual uh, um, artifacts on uh, early colonial sites. And we have Tingway's earthenware. Um, I don't have the data with me right now for the, the, to talk about exactly what kinds of vessels were present uh, and what types there were on the site. But Tinglays, uh, again, may, may be made in, in the Netherlands, but more likely made in uh, England and somewhere around London. Uh, but this would have been some pretty nice stuff. Uh, often exhibited on top of a mantle when not actually in use. And of course, because it's me talking, we got bones. So uh, we've just recently reanalyzed the fall remains from this site, part of a larger study looking at, I think, eight uh, early colonial sites from Southern Maryland. Uh, trying to look at dietary patterns. And this side was kind of interesting. I mean, it had, it had turkey and chicken, which when we have preserved bird remains, not unusual on these sites. But for fish, we have catfish, uh, which you might expect to find in the tributaries to the Patuxent. Uh, catfish are bottom feeders, shallow water. You don't need a lot of oxygen. We also have rockfish and rockfish slash white perch. Rockfish and white perch are the same genus, Morone, M-O-R-O-N-E, and they look virtually identical. In fact, the only way I can tell them apart in terms of bones is um, uh, size. Rockfish tend to be a lot bigger than white perch, but they're different behaviorally. White perch will come up into the streams uh, to reproduce. So I'm betting, yeah, maybe it's rockfish, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if all of these were in fact white perch. Because again, the site is five or six miles uh, from the Patuxent River. It's a long Swanson Creek, which would have had at certain times of the year, white perch and catfish all the time. So um, I think we're seeing that in terms of dietary remains a reflection of simply where they were living. Not necessarily a food choice, just this is what was available. We get some mollusks. There are oyster shells on the site, but there aren't very many. And uh, a couple of months ago, I talked about the William Go plantation in Bowie. It was the same thing. Some oyster present, but not a lot. And that's not surprising, given that both of these sites are not near uh, the kinds of waters uh, that oysters would occupy. The water isn't saline enough. There's not enough salt. We did recover one example of yellow lance mussel, and we, we got a couple of dozen, uh, a dozen or so from uh, the William Go plantation. Yellow lance mussels used to be uh, quite common in the tributaries uh, of the Chesapeake Bay, up the Patuxent River, the Potomac River. They have effectively been extirpated. Uh, you can still find examples, they're not extinct, uh, but they are quite rare and particularly in the Chesapeake drainage these days. Whether or not these people are eating them, it's not clear. We never find a lot of them, so it doesn't look like they're eating them, but maybe they're collecting them for using for fish bait, who knows. 
This site is really interesting because the number of turtle remains we've got, um, and some really big pieces too. It's pretty obvious. These these aren't we're not we weren't finding intact turtles. You know, it wasn't a turtle that dug his way into the ground and died of old age or whatever, and so we're basically digging up a, a corpse. These are food remains. These folks were eating turtle on a scale that we've not seen on any of the other sites. And that may be because Swanson Creek is kind of a, a languid creek, you know, it just sort of curves around, uh, got a lot of wetlands associated with, with it. There might just have been a lot of turtle around. These folks had a taste for it. But the site is exceptional, exceptional for the amount of uh, turtle we've got. And in terms of mammal remains, uh, again, it's very similar to the other colonial sites we've been looking at. Uh, the, the, the big three are there, cow, pig, and sheep. Uh, in this case, pig remains are the most common. Uh, cow are uh, somewhat distant second. And sheep are uncommon, but they're there. And that's kind of interesting for colonial sites. Uh, uh, Henry Miller had posited uh, back in 1984 that uh, sheep would be uncommon on 17th century sites, at least until the last half of the 17th century, mostly because it was so hard to protect them. It required a lot of investment in infrastructure and, of course, shooting a lot of wolves, coyotes, and foxes. Deer, not surprisingly, are almost absent. These folks, again, are not hunting. They're surviving on uh, domestic livestock that they've either brought over themselves or bought from other settlers who uh, either brought it over from the old world or were successful in raising them in the new world. We do have a lot of unidentified mammal bones. It's not unusual for these sites, uh, perhaps more than most, uh, but they're all gonna be cow, pig, sheep, or deer. But the identifiable stuff, you can see it there. Pig is tops, followed by cow, sheep a distant sec, sec, uh, third, and white tail deer virtually absent. We also have some raccoon and red fox, just a few specimens of each. And that suggests, and again, we've seen this on some other 17th century and eight, early 18th century sites, that these folks are uh, trapping for pelts. Uh, might have been a little sideline in which they were engaged, uh, uh, catching fur-bearing animals, uh, preparing their pelts for shipment back for basically ready cash. Uh, that needs to be investigated further, but we are finding these uh, species suitable for, for, for pelts uh, on most of these sites. So here uh, is the... Uh, footprint of the building. These are the post holes. You can see every single one of them is a replacement post. Every single one replaces an original post. They haven't changed the size of the building, which is quite small. It's, you know, 20 by 16 or something like that. It's not very big. And it has that, that uh, cellar hole, that root cellar right in the middle. And then Below it are all these trash-filled borrow pits that supplied material for the daub on the Waddle and Daub chimneys. For those of you who've seen these footprints before, you might look at it and go, well, that's interesting. It had a Waddle and Daub fireplace. Where's the chimney bay? Others of you may ask, what is a chimney bay? So I will show you. This is the Patuxent Point house site. Post holes, a few of them have been replaced, but I mean, it looks like single construction here. But you'll notice, you know, these posts tend to be, I don't know, 10, 15 feet apart. But at the north end of this building, we've got posts that are set very close together. And the red here shows that these are small pits that are filled with burned daub or charcoal and some burned daub. It suggests that this was the fireplace at this end. They added, uh, added to the building a small section to support the framework of the fireplace. Let's see if I got it drawn. There we go. So you, you could see it drawn here. 
That's the that's the chimney uh, the chimney bay, and this is the main building. This would be the hall, sort of the kitchen, and this part past this post hall would be the parlor, or basically the master bedroom, if you will, and then some sort of addition off the side, and there would be a loft to this thing too, where uh, people would either sleep up in that loft or in the kitchen, which would be the warm room anyway. It had a fireplace, but this building here, there's no chimney. Bay. And Carolyn Grichkowski, who you saw in a couple of these images, uh, I tortured her, having her trowel and trowel and trowel through some very hard soil that was drying out in the sun. Um, this, I, I've been a brute all my life. Um, so I made her do it. And she was visibly frustrated because she'd trowel through all this hard stuff and there was no sign of a chimney bay. So we just couldn't figure it out. Didn't make any sense. And it remained a mystery. Sure, sure. Until again, I started preparing this material for a publication, for publication in Maryland Archaeology, the journal for the Archaeological Society of Maryland. And I realized, I, in doing that research, I, I learned that Bernard Johnson, despite his very Anglo sounding name, was a Dutchman. And it occurred to me if he was a Dutchman, he may have built a Dutch style house which wouldn't have a chimney bay. And you can see in this image on the right, this is, based, this is the chimney up here. The hearth is flat on the ground. This is the wall. There is no separate fireplace as is typical on British structures. Uh, the, the hearth basically just sits on the floor and then you have a hood above with the chimney through which the smoke rises. And that would account for our lack of a chimney bay that would account for all that burned daub winding up in the root cellar, which is separated from the house. I mean, this would be the end wall here. So it's pretty close to the end wall, but not quite there. So there was, there was probably the hearth right here. And what had collapsed in would have been that uh, hood, that uh, uh, daub, that mud caked hood when the building burned. So it's referred to as a jamless fireplace hood. Uh -huh. And there it is, they, they kind of all made sense. It took several years for me to get to this. Uh, and that's why it's so important to revisit these sites, to rethink them, compare them to other sites, because uh, none of us in archeology span are geniuses. All the geniuses went into uh, nuclear physics. Um, we kind of plot along at our own pace. And sometimes it just takes a little while to figure these things out. So it's really important to revisit these sites. Just because it's dug, even if it's reported and published, it still isn't done. There's always room for improvement. So anyway, that's the short story about uh, our Dutchman in Southern Prince George's County. And I'm more than happy to take questions. Um. I do have one question about the process. Now, normally when I'm used to seeing a site, you're going out and you're digging either test shovel pits or one by ones and that type of thing. This looked like it was sort of haphazard. Um, maybe I missed it at the beginning about how you did, went about doing that. Yeah, uh, sometimes, and this is less and less commonly the case, is a, a field is plowed and we could just walk the plowed field and map in the locations of the stuff we find and where that stuff is clustered, you know, that's where the site, that's where the features are anyway. The plantation was 150 acres. Okay. But we're only focusing on the house lot and specifically the house and crash pits and whatnot. So uh, we did do surface collection and then we um, you know, recall us doing shovel test pits. So we might have to try to find the limits. And we certainly did some excavation units uh, I think three foot on a side. None of them proved terribly satisfactory. The plowed material told us where the site was. Um, those other techniques, especially shovel testing, is good for finding sites, particularly when you have no surface visibility. But beyond that, you know, they're not really that useful. Once you find the site, you need a different suite of techniques. So that's what we did here. It's sort of classic for these kinds of sites of this period bring in the heavy machinery, strip off the plowed soils, map what we got. Uh, and in fact, 
why it was about the same time that we were digging another early 18th century site in Calvert County, in Prince Frederick, the Roberts site, using the same techniques. Mm. Any other questions? Hey, Jim, does it relate to Garrett's Chance, which was also at Equesco? It is Garrett's Chance. Okay. So I did dig that site. <laughs> you did work on it. I guess I didn't have any photographs of you. Yeah, because it, it, the artifacts and the footprint was really matching up. I says, wait a minute, been there, done that. Yeah, so. <laughs> it's easy to lose track. I can't remember what I did last week, but. Uh, <laughs> well, it has uh, been a few years. Yeah, well, it's been, yeah, 17 years. Mm -hmm. um, but again, we're revisiting this site along with uh, a bunch of others for this okay. uh, proposed book. Uh, dietary patterns, so I'm reacquainting cool. myself. And for those of you who are interested, um, it is published in uh, Maryland Archaeology, September 2006. So two years after mm -hmm. doing the site, after writing a report and in preparing that article is when I made the connection between Bernard Johnson and his Dutch heritage. Any other questions, comments, criticisms, complaints? Would they would they have had a, like a loo? We, we did not find a privy, um, and that's I'd say that's not unusual for these early colonial sites, but I suspect more often than not we are finding them and not recognizing them. Uh, for the Patuxent Point site which I guess I could pull up here. Um, right next to the ha house, well, it's, I got it marked on there, privy. And it's about three foot long, foot and a half, two feet wide, foot and a half deep maybe, has lenses of ash in it, along with fish scales and all kinds of other trash. We are actually reanalyzing that material right now at CERC. That, I am quite sure, is a privy. Uh, but there's no structure there. And it's very different from the William Go plantation in Bowie, where we had these deep cylindrical privy holes that went down six to eight feet. Uh, those in the 17th century seem to be a bit more casual. It does suggest that um, certain behaviors were not as private as they are today. I think most of us, if we lived in this period, would just be downright disgusted. <laughs> they have been using the material from the privy as fertilizer for their crops. I, I doubt it. Um, for one thing, they probably, they probably, they probably, yeah, night soil. They probably now that was that behavior had been around in in, the, in Europe for centuries, right? Uh, and seems to date back to initial agriculture in, in Southwest Asia. Um, but I suspect they weren't producing enough, nor did they particularly care or understand. I mean, um, not all these folks who came to the New World and started these plantations was necessarily a farmer. True. He came yeah. from various walks of life. Bernard Johnson was a cooper. You know, what did he know about raising tobacco? Um, mm. So these, these prebbies are probably out there, but we may not be recognizing them. Or they may have been using these borrow pits too. You know, they might have been kind of multi-use open pits. Again, I, I'm beginning to suspect, based on our work with the William Go Plantation of Bowie, that attitudes towards privacy and foul smells was nothing like ours today. Uh, these people might best be described as earthy. And that, that continues into the 18th century. Didn't bathe. <laughs> yeah, bathing would, you know, nowadays you turn on the news. Unhealthy and, back then, they said. <laughs> well, now you turn on the news when they're talking about working class people, you know, and, and, and office workers. There's the people who shower in the morning before work and the people who shower after work. Actually, many archaeologists shower before and after. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, these people were doing some pretty nasty work and they didn't shower at all. Uh, bathing was probably a more of a seasonal thing at that. Uh, so, yeah, very often I've been at museums and, you know, we're 
you know, you've got a, a docent interpreting sites and whatnot. And docents and visiting public alike will be talking about, well, they were pretty much just like uh, us. And, and, and archaeology suggests that they weren't, that they had very different attitudes towards a lot of different things. We know most of them had very different attitudes towards politics and religion, um, literature, or, you know, dismissing literature. Um, a very different people. I think that's really coming out in the archaeology. Yeah. Is that the site where we found a lens of white sand that we couldn't figure out why they were using it? It was either right in front of the hearth or it was right in front of the door. I can't remember which. Doesn't ring a bell. Because we, I know it was down that way. I can't remember if it was that one or. Well, you work maybe. at the Robertson site in Prince George's County too. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, Prince George, yeah. Calvert County. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So no, it doesn't ring a bell, but. You know, there's been so many sites over the years that 